story where Jesus is approached by one of the teachers of the law in his day. And the particular teacher of the law asked Jesus a question, um, basically concerning what he needed to do to have eternal life. And as Jesus and this, perfect, and this uh, teacher of the law are talking and dialoguing together, uh, out of that is birthed what we now know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I want to look at a brief snippet of that today um, for this message. Uh, picking up in Luke 10, verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. On April 3rd, 1968, the day before Martin Luther King was killed. He was in Memphis, Tennessee, speaking at a Pentecostal church called Mason Temple. He had been in the area uh, because he was supporting a strike that was taking place at the time by sanitation workers in the Memphis area. And uh, as he spoke, uh, that speech became known in history as the I've Been in the Mountaintop speech, which ended up being one of his most famous, in part because of the fact that he was killed the next day. And while many of us, and probably all of us, have heard the final minute and a half or so of that speech, uh, which has become very famous, uh, what a lot of us probably don't know, and what most people don't realize, is that the majority of the sermon or speech, depending on what you want to refer to it as, um, was not included in that snippet. And uh, one of the primary passages of scripture that Martin Luther King used um, as he was speaking to the crowd that night was the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as he was speaking, there were two questions that he really juxtaposed. And to understand them, it's very important that you understand a little bit about the geographical context of the parable that Jesus uh, is talking. In verse 10, uh, we read the phrase, man was going down from Jericho to Jerusalem. To us, that doesn't really mean a whole lot because that's not anything we really have a framework for, particularly. Jesus could have picked any two cities that happened to be in the area arbitrarily, and we would probably view the parable the same exact way. But to the listener in Jesus' day, um, there would have been a very specific meaning to the fact that he chose Jerusalem and Jericho um, because of the fact that the road in between those two cities had a reputation of being extremely dangerous. So much so that it was actually known in Jesus' day as Bloody Pass. And the reasons for this are twofold, partially because uh, there's a very steep drop in elevation uh, which makes the climb difficult in and of itself along the road. And second of all, um, just because of the layout of the area, um, it happens to be in large portions of the road, uh, prime spots for robbers to hide and jump out to attack people who are coming through. And it was known for that. And one of the questions that would immediately come into a person's mind as they were walking along this road, if they were to see somebody who had been attacked by robbers, would be, if I stop to help them, what would that mean for me? What would, what, would that put me in danger, essentially? Um, for two reasons, again. Uh, first of all, if you have somebody that's injured traveling with you, it's going to make the trip longer, you'll be on the road longer. Obviously, we know it's a dangerous road. Second of all, um, there's always the possibility that a person on the side of the road is faking it, um, just to attract people over so that he could rob them. Maybe there's a gang of people hiding behind um, some bushes in the area or something along those lines. Um, that's reading into the story a little bit. Um, but whatever the case may be, um, that would be a natural question that would immediately have come to somebody's mind if they were to see this type of situation in real life. And this question, um, though not included in the parable itself, uh, lines up very closely with the responses of the Levite and the priest who are walking. Um, as they walk, they see the man, they're clearly aware of what appears to have happened, and they do nothing about it. They continue on their way, they don't stop to help him, and they don't make any effort in the context of the parable to send help back for him. Um, but the response of the Samaritan when the Samaritan gets there is very different. 
And what he kind of does is flips the question upside down and thinks something along the lines of, if I do not stop to help this man, what will it mean for him? And what I want to just challenge us with today um, is the question of who is the person on the side of the road for you? Um, in different cultural contexts, and different ministerial contexts, the exact person that's on the side of the road is going to be different. Um, but there's always somebody, somebody that we can think of or somebody that we will come across at some point who's that person on the side of the road for us. Um, for Jesus, we were the ones on the side of the road. On this particular occasion for Martin Luther King, uh, the sanitation workers of Memphis were the ones that he saw on the side of the road. Um, but for each of us, we have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and recognize as we're going through life who the people are on the side of the road that he's calling us to help. And just as importantly, determine beforehand uh, whether or not we're going to be obedient, even though it has the potential to cost us something. Good job, man.